Let's say Burkim Hava Aim to all of our first time guests in the house. And we welcome anybody that's here first time in the sanctuary today. Any first timers? I think it's, oh, we got a first timer in the house. Good, good, good. And uh, again, we'll apologize for all of the little issues with heat and internet and this building. It's kind of an older building, but you know what? Thank God we're all here. We're alive. We've got breath in our lungs to praise the Lord. And we prayed and believed God for a great day. How many know anytime the enemy tries to come in and stir stuff, something up, or there's a kind of an attack on your life, that just means blessing is around the corner. Amen. Amen. So you definitely showed up to the right service today. Amen. So we get right into the word of God. And we've been in a series that we've been looking at that's really a powerful series. And uh, it is called The Journey of a Disciple. The Journey of a Disciple. And we started with Rabbi Eric launching us off. He's at the hospital, so continue to pray for his wife's brother and Jonathan, and we're just praying for healing for him. But we know that he's been through a lot of ups and downs in his situation. But Rabbi Eric got us started with this series, and it was called Guarding the Sacred, The Journey of Personal and Spiritual Growth. Because we wanted the whole focus of the series to be about studying the journey of Moses and his Torah students teaches us how to train dedicated disciples of Messiah. And we learned that in Jewish culture, before you contrast, you should always compare. So we're comparing Moses with, with Yeshua. We're comparing his leading of the Israelites out of Egypt through the wilderness towards the promised land as the same spiritual journey as disciples of Yeshua were journeying from where we were, we were in bondage. And now through the promises of God, God has a blessing at the end of our destination that we're trying to enter into those blessings and into those promises. Amen? So I picked up with the second day celebration of Shavuot. We did the journey from the wilderness to the promised land. Our third message for Parshat Naso was the blessing of becoming a disciple. The next portion was Bechalot Tacha, and we did the spiritual growth of a disciple. And then for Shalach Lacha, the teaching of the 12 spies that go out into the land and 10 came back with a negative report and two came back, Joshua and Caleb, with a good report. We talked about every disciple needs a spiritual father. And then we had Rabbi Eric do another message while I was out of town called Holiness in the Midst of Rebellion. That was dealing with Korach and that rebellion that swallowed up 250 Reubenites and Datan and Abiram with them. And we're grateful that the sons of Korah became psalmists. In the Psalms, there are quite a few sons of Korah psalms, and we're thankful that just because you sin and you mess up doesn't mean your children have to fall in that same trap, literally. <laughs> and then we talked about for a double portion of Hukat and Balak. Two weeks ago, we dealt with every disciple needs discipline and development and last week, our eighth teaching for Pinchas, we dealt with every zealous disciple hungers for more knowledge. We talked about that zeal of Pinchas or Phineas, and he was zealous for God with the zeal for God and the zeal of God. And we know the zeal of the, of the Lord will perform the things that are prophesied in the scriptures, especially the coming of Messiah and him sitting on David's throne. If you're reading Isaiah chapter 6, um, and reading, um, or actually chapter 9, 7 through 8 especially, you see how the zeal of the Lord is so important in a believer's life. And then we have today, my slide did not pop up, but I definitely will replace that. But it is called um, Every every Disciple um, Should Stay, uh, Should Keep Their Commitment to Their Vow. Every Disciple Should commit, Keep Their Commitment to Their Vow. I'll have to switch that later. But our readings come from a double portion of Numbers 30, verse 2, or in some versions, verse 1, all the way to 36, the end of the book, verse 13. Reading that has been read for thousands of years to line up with this portion. And then the great messianic suggestion is the book of James, which you know is really Jacob or Yaakov, chapter 4, 1 through 12. Right. So now we get read into our final download of our double portion for this week, and that is with a theme verse for this whole series, out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, let's start with verse 2. It says, Behold, at my rebuke, 
I dry up the sea and I make the rivers a desert. Says the servant of God says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple and one who is taught that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as a disciple or as one who is taught. Let me see the hand of those again who can say you are a disciple of the Lord. You are taught of the Lord. How I many know we are supposed to all be disciples? And the, the Bible actually prophesies that all of our children will be taught of the Lord or be, become disciples of the Lord. And we have talked about how the great commission of our Messiah is not to make more Christians, Baptists, Pentecostals, Lutherans, Mennonites, Quakers. I mean, you can go down the list of religious expressions and denominations, and that's never been Yeshua's goal. Yeshua doesn't matter. Who you are, where you've come from, what your ethnic background is, as long as you're willing to follow him and become his disciple and he can transform your life. That's the goal. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile or you're male or you're female, you're younger, you're older, or you're richer or you're poorer. Sounds like vows at a wedding, but you know, <laughs> you know, God, God doesn't care about those things because he knows your heart and he knows where you're at. I mean, he knows what step you need to take next in your journey. Because if the goal is becoming a, a disciple of Yeshua, then you and I are on a journey to go from where we're at to where we need to be in life. And whatever it takes, we need to do that. We need to be that kind of diligent disciple who is determined to develop and grow and not stay the same. I know too many people that name the name of the Lord. They say that they are believers. But in maybe five, ten years of seeing them, they seem to be exactly the same person without any growth or development because they have settled for just staying in the position of, well, I'm a believer. Well, I know the Lord. My sins are forgiven. And I'm telling you, there's got to be more than just knowing your sins are forgiven. That's great you know your sins are forgiven. But you've got to become that young warrior, that young man that knows how to use the weapons of warfare. We'll talk about the disciple John who discusses that. But it's so important for you and I to know there is more. Come on, tell yourself there's more. more. Tell your neighbor there's more. more. I mean, just think for a minute. Ask yourself where you want to be a year from today. You know your phone will sometimes give you a memory, like a year ago, it shows you this picture, and you're like, well, I forgot I went to this place, or I forgot I went to this graduation, or I went to this celebration, or I forgot I was at a wedding a year ago, and they give you memories. And sometimes when you get a memory, it reminds you not only of what you've done and where you've been, but it shows you where you're at. And it also reminds you where you could be. Because sometimes you look year after year at memories, and you're like, man, okay, I did the same thing last year and the year before that, and you know, went to the same vacation spot. I never did anything differently in my life. And are you going to one day wake up regretting that I could have done so much more with my life? I could have discovered my purpose. I could have downloaded the plan of God. I could have studied his Torah more. I could have read through the prophets. I could have taken a whole book of the Bible and just break it down word by word. If you want to get adventurous, go letter by letter in Hebrew. I mean, there's so much richness to every root letter. You know, there's so much more. And I know for me, I will never stop being a disciple because I don't want to ever get to the place where I think I've arrived. I want to stay a learner because we said that followers are not often learners, but disciples are. Followers follow a crowd, and they even follow social media platforms. Come on, why do you think people are on Twitter? Because they want more followers. Or they like the likes, right? And the thumbs up and the hearts. And you go to your phone looking every day to say, who likes you? And then you also notice who doesn't like you. Or at least you assume they don't like you because they didn't, you didn't get a heart from them or a like, or you didn't follow. Like the, that's the rabbi podcast. Sorry, that was a self, selfish plug there. But there's the things that you have to do in life to say, you know what? I don't care what people think about me. I'm more concerned about pleasing God than pleasing man. And I want to know that the Lord is going to say to me, well done, my good. And here's the key word, faithful servant. We're all servants of the Lord. But if he says well done to you, it's not because rabbi's ribeye is cooked just perfect. Well, it's not that because actually I don't like mine well done. I like mine a little bit to move a little, you know. But well done from the Father means that you have been faithful to what God put in your life. 
Ask yourself where you lack faithfulness. I'll show you the area where you need to be more disciplined and discipled in. Wherever you lack faithfulness is the very area that you and I both have to be more disciplined and have more discipleship in our life. And if no one's discipling us in that area, we're going to be the same person we were a year ago today and the same person a year from now as we are right now. And I don't think any one of us want to stay way with the way we are. That's why you're here. How many would say every congregation you've gone to, especially to a messianic one, it has taken you to higher heights, deeper depths, because there's more to God than just cookie cutter doctrine and dogmas. Well, God only does this at certain times. And, you know, you know, to the point where we even try to, dis to discern between the wheat and the tare before it's time for full maturity. I can't discern whether you're a wheat or a tare in the early stages. I have to wait for God himself to send his angels to separate between the wheat and the tare. How many know at the end of Yeshua's life, he found out who Judas was. He probably already discerned who Judas was. But he proved himself to be a tear instead of wheat, sadly enough. Because at any moment, if he was true wheat, he would allow the gardener, the farmer, the one who is making sure that there is a full harvest at the end of the age, he would make sure that that wheat needed, get, would, would receive whatever it needed to grow to full maturity. But tares will never grow to full maturity. In fact, you know there's a difference between wheat and tares? I wish I had a picture of this. At the full maturation of the wheat, it actually bows its head down in humility. And the, the actual tear grows up looking like wheat in the early stages, but keeps its head, you know, so held up high, like, you know, I don't need to bow. And you can almost see at the end, you know, those who bow and those who don't. You didn't catch that. Do I have to go back to the book of Daniel? Do I have to go back? Do I have to go to the book of Revelation? Tell, there's going to be some that bow and then some who don't. Because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Yeshua is Lord. Now think about this. You're either going to bow now in this lifetime or one day you're going to bow in the next. I'd rather bow my life now. I'd rather fall on the rock and be crushed than to, or, or to be broken than to have the rock fall on me one day and be crushed. I think it's important for you and I to become like this passage says, that morning by morning, the Spirit of God is waking us up with an ear to hear as a disciple. And those that wake up spiritually, that ear of, of, of hearing, that, those eyes of understanding, that heart of discerning, they're the ones that Yeshua can call his disciple. Anyone else, they're going to sleep in when God's trying to speak. They're going to go to bed early and not wake up when at the midnight hour God wakes you up to pray for someone. See, when you're attentive as a disciple, you got ears to hear. you got eyes that discern and see. you got a heart that has an understanding, that walks in wisdom. And so as we take a look at what this final message is all about, this idea of every vow that we have keeping our commitment. And I mean a vow not just to, well, I'm going to pay you back a certain amount of money or I'm going to make a vow in, in marriage to you, how about the vow to Yeshua? Let's keep our vow. If we say we're going to follow him, let's follow him. If we say we're going to steady show ourselves good unto God, let's do that. Amen? The Torah says this in Numbers 30 verse 1, Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the people of Israel, saying, this is what the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. If you look at the words of Moses in his final book that we'll get ready next week to start looking into, Devarim or Deuteronomy 21-22 22, uh, says, When you make a vow to Adonai your God, you are not to delay to make, uh, to make good on it. For Adonai, your God, will certainly require it of you, and you would have sin on you. In other words, the sin is, if you make a vow and then you break it or don't fulfill it, it's sin. The Bible also says, when you know to do good and you don't do it, it's sin. And anything that is not of faith is also sin. 
So think about it. You said yes to Yeshua. You made a commitment about. And all of a sudden along the way, you're kind of like, well, not today, Lord. I'm going on vacation. I don't have time for that for prayer today. You know, I have people that tell me that, even pastors that tell me that, oh yeah, I'm going on vacation. I'm not even going to read my Bible. I'm going. Now I can understand not doing like deep Bible study for a, like a message or sermon or you know personal devotion, but to wake up in the morning in a beautiful location on your vacation and not have your mind on God or want to hear from your father, I think that's a that's a paradigm shift that we think studying our Bible is just about getting more knowledge. It's not. It's about hearing from our Father in heaven. And sons and daughters are listening to the voice of God through the Spirit of God inside them. That their ears being awakened and their eyes are opening and their heart is enlarging to understanding they didn't have before. Like, Father, thank you. Lead me and guide me today. Show me what you want me to do. Show me who you want me to minister to. Have you ever asked yourself, you know, or asked the Lord, you know, Lord, who am I supposed to minister to today? Who am I supposed to encourage today? Remember, Isaiah 50 told us in verse 4 that we should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. What if you meet someone on the road and you, you say, I want to be your humble servant today. And yet you see someone on the side of the road and, well, I'm not going to talk to them because I'm on vacation. The reason I'm saying this is because I just came from five days of vacationing in cooler weather in Huntington Beach. I was there for five days, drove back um, uh, uh, Friday afternoon and uh, was able to get the challah bread made in on time before our sundown. Uh, I think about 3.30, got back in town and fought a little bit of traffic to get home. And it was so good to be on a vacation. But to me, that's more time to spend with the Lord, not less. So you don't go on vacation with God, on God, right? And please, if you're gonna go on vacation, don't say, I'm gonna take my tithe and my offering with me and spend it on the vacay. Well, the Lord knows I need Chick-fil-A. Well, the Lord knows I need Raising Cane's, really? God will provide that, but you stay faithful to the covenant that you have made a vow to him. And you know, if you're, you're giving faithfully your tithe and your offering, don't do it because the rabbi is asking you to give, because that's not what I'm going to do. That's why we have a sadaka box in the back. If you want to give, that little box right back there, you just drop it in on the way in or the way out. It's, it's all between you and God. It's your commitment. It's your vow. I'm not, I'm not looking at the book saying, oh, who's giving, not giving? I, I chose a long time ago to stay away from even trying to figure people out. Even the person that is in your face the most, oh, that was such a great message. They might be giving you an amen, but they might not be supporting the ministry otherwise. So you want to make sure you have a balanced life. You know, not just all in front of people. But Yeshua says even, you know, that little mite that the widow gave. It was more valuable than all the gifts of the Pharisees that they gave at the temple because they were doing it for pride's sake. So don't sound the shofar when, when all of a sudden you want people to see, look how much money I gave. That's not true discipleship. Discipleship means there's a discipline on the inside of me spiritually that is generous and loves to give and is faithful to God in whether it's my giving, my time, my talent, my treasure, whatever it is. You give yourself to God. So the first thing I want you to know is, first of all, disciples should keep their vows. Disciples should keep their what? Vows. Their vows. And to know that, we go back to Yeshua's teaching of Torah in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Look what it says in Matthew 5.33. It says, Again, you have heard that our fathers were told, Do not break my oath and keep your vows to Adonai. How many see that he's quoting the Torah? He's quoting the Torah right there. But I tell you not to swear at all, not by heaven, because it's God's house, I mean, excuse, God's throne, and not by earth, because it's his footstool, and not by Yerushalayim, which is Jerusalem, because it's the city of the great king. And don't swear by your head, because you can't make a single hair white or black. Just let your yes be a simple yes, and your no a simple no. Anything more than this has its origin in evil. Now let me tell you what Yeshua is not saying. Yeshua is not saying that the vows made at the altar, at the tabernacle, later the temple, are now null and void or not valid. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, we find ourselves getting caught in this, is when we want to convince someone that we're going to pay them back money or we're going to be there on time, we say, oh, no, I swear to God, 
or I swear by heaven, or I swear by, I swear by the hair on my chinny chin chin. I swear on, I've heard people say, I swear on the, on the uh, life of my children. I'm like, please don't do that. God forbid if we were to base the vow on the life of your children, whether they live or die. I don't think that's a good vow to make. Yeshua is just saying you shouldn't have to have anything back up your personal vows except your own yes and no. And I love the fact that he didn't do a third option in there. He said, let your yes be yes, your maybe be maybe, your no be no. He says, you know what? Better not to even make a vow Well, I might be there. No one cares if you might be there. They actually care if you're going to be there. Just say, I'm going to be there. And then don't, you know, find a, a way to text them later like, I was going to go, but... You know, I, I got caught up. My dog needed to be walked. You know, um, I was thirsty, so I had to drink like a lot of water. My doctor said I have to. And, you know, well, you don't understand. My kids were being noisy, and I just I couldn't focus or concentrate, so I really couldn't study my word today. No, no, no. Don't make excuses. Because we're only hurting ourselves in the long run when we make us an excuse over and over again for something we say we want to develop in our life. We say... We want to grow in our life. We say we want to be discipled in in our life. Are you with me? We have to be careful about excuses. Look what Luke 9.59 says. Yeshua said to one of, one of the men that were following him, he says, follow me. But that one said, let me first go and bury my father. Okay. His father wasn't dead. <laughs> he was just saying, my parents are older. And it's going to, maybe for the next few years, I'm going to put off following you, Yeshua, because i got to take care of my parents. i got to put my father eventually in the grave. That was just a way to say, I have responsibilities at home i got to take care of. And then when I'm unencumbered by anything, then I'll finally follow you. How many know there's never going to be a day in your life where you're unencumbered from work? Or that you're not, unless you're in the grave yourself. There is, you know, or in the sweet by and by. There's never going to be a day where you don't have stuff going on. How many can raise your hand and say, I got stuff going on? I, I say, say, come on, I got things to do. But that should never come before doing the Lord's business. Yeshua, he, he himself told his parents at age 12, didn't you know that I was here to do my father's business? Yeshua at 12 put God, his father, first. Yes, he honored his parents second. <laughs> he said, okay, mom, I'll, I'll do what you say. And he says he honored his parents. But he honored his father in heaven first. He actually honored in the right order. And I love what it says in the next part of the verse. The excuse number one was, well, let me go bury my father. The second uh, thing you see here is in verse 60. But Yeshua said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. Now, that, that can be very confusing. Some versions say, let the spiritually dead bury the dead. You know, it just means... Leave dead things for dead things. Like, you know, when it comes down to when he finally passes, then you can worry about burying your father. But if that's the excuse you're going to use, there's other people that can handle those things for you. So we see that he says, let the dead bury the dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. I love the fact that all of the parables were teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God. Or as Matthew usually likes to say, the kingdom of heaven. And I talk about this, about the difference between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. Um, and I think it's very important for people to know Matthew exclusively uses kingdom of heaven as a respectful way to use what we call a circumlocution. A circumlocution is a, a way to reference something holy, sanctified, set apart, or someone who is set apart without saying their name, which would then maybe use their name in vain. So since the, the commandment is thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain, Instead of saying kingdom of God, which in Hebrew would be Elohim, Malchut Elohim, he says, well, let's say Malchut Hashemayim, kingdom of heaven. Because where does God rule and reign? In the heavens. So that's where his kingdom is, in the heavenly realm. But these parables are supposed to teach you about the functionality. How does the kingdom function? Not where is the kingdom. How many of the kingdom technically has no location? doesn't necessarily, it's not a place more than it is a reality that God is the sovereign king of the universe and wherever we allow the sovereign reign of God to rule, that's where his kingdom rules. 
And one day all the kings of this earth is going to come under his sovereign rulership. So that is the kingdom. Whether you say the kingdom is near or the kingdom is within you or the kingdom is something you pray. You're praying the kingdom come, but yet the kingdom's already here. So it's a, it's a reality that means wherever the rule and reign of the kingdom is, that's where the kingdom has come or is residing. So when this is said here, go proclaim the kingdom of God. In other words, he's saying your focus is off. Your excuse is not working. Your job as my disciple, if you're going to follow me, is to proclaim the kingdom of God. To tell people about the kingdom. First of all, you've got to understand how the kingdom functions. So 61 says, then another also said, I will follow you. Notice this one bold, it says, I will follow you. I will, I will. But I will is still future tense. Because you know how you know someone's following you? You turn around and they're there. You, it's action. It's not words. Oh, I'm going to follow you. If you say you're going to follow me on social media, and I look, and I will see you. Then you didn't follow me. But you said you were going to. But I will follow you, Yeshua. But what happens between I will before it becomes I didn't? Look what happens. It says, I will follow you, Master. But first, let me say goodbye to those in my home. First. In other words, you're putting them first before me. That should have never been an excuse. Yeshua has no problem with you going home and saying, bye to mom and dad. Hey, I'm going to start traveling with this traveling rabbi. He had no problem with that. But it's like he used it. He weaponized it as an excuse. I will follow you, but let me do something else first before that. You know, you can follow Yeshua right now in your heart. It doesn't, it doesn't even require technically the sinner's prayer because we created that thing. I have no problem with confessing your sins. I have no problem with actually making a declaration of faith. I have no problem with any of those kind of vows. But when we tell people you have to pray the sinner's prayer to get saved. Okay, so the guy on the cross was on one of the sides of Yeshua. And Yeshua said, you'll be with me in paradise. Did anybody take him through the four spiritual laws or the, or the Romans road to salvation? Which the book of Romans wasn't written yet. The only Roman road was the one that the Romans built. Sometimes we have put God in such a box. All it takes to follow him is just say yes. And in your heart, begin to move from your heart saying yes to your actions saying yes. All he had to do was, you know, I'll go see my parents later and tell them, you know, I'm officially traveling you, but where you're going right now, I'm going to follow them. Why was there an excuse? The same reason we have excuses. It says in verse 62 that Yeshua said to him, no one who has put his hand to the plow and looked back is fit for the kingdom of God. There he is. In other words, if I'm your king and I ask you to do something, how I know you're a faithful servant of the kingdom is you do what I ask you to do. There is no and, if, or but, well, one day I will, or maybe I might, or I can't because. It can't be any excuses. You see, our excuses might look a little different. You see, if we're lacking submission and total surrender, our excuse might sound like this. Well, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. Or maybe next time. <coughs> you know, I invite people to, to say, go to a life group or, you know, do something, you know, that will grow their faith. And they'll say, you know, I can't right now, but next time I will. When's that next time coming? Do I have to go back to him and invite him again and again? And again, because see, as long as there's an invite, you keep saying next time, next time, next time, there won't be a next time. Because you never know when there's going to be a next time. How many know even today is not promised? So if Yeshua was asking you to come join him, be a part of his kingdom, and you tell the Lord, I'm not ready yet, or maybe next time. So that could have been the day before his crucifixion or the day of his crucifixion. He's going to die and resurrect from the dead. And you're going to go look for him to follow him, and he's not around. But he's in heavenly places with the Father. And you're going to be looking for him. And now it's going to be hard to find him, because now you've got to look for him with your spiritual eyes. And spirit. Right there, you had him in person. How much more easier would it be to follow Yeshua if we could actually pray with him, walk with him, live with him, go to temple with him, go to synagogue with him, hear him pray, 
hear him study, hear him quote the word of God. Wouldn't it be great if we had living examples like Yeshua on the earth to follow the lead of others? Sadly enough, we don't have enough representatives of Yeshua. We have people that name the name of Yeshua, but their life is not worthy to follow because they say and don't do like some of the Pharisees. Not all Pharisees were bad. Some were very good, like Nicodemus changed, changed to be a follower of Yeshua. Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, follower of Yeshua, both Pharisees. All Pharisees weren't bad. The Talmud actually says it's a ratio of two good out of seven. It's true. It says there's blind Pharisees, there's Pharisees that walk in walls because all they're focused on is their little narrow focus of their command that they're trying to do. They're burdened by their commandments. They're burdening others with commandments. There's all these things that you can find in Matthew 23 that the Talmud actually says out of seven types of Pharisees, there's two that do it out of a fear or reverence of God or the love of God. And those are the ones to follow, it says. So there were good Pharisees. So what about this one? If you have a lack of priority and urgency, your excuse might be like this. Well, let me think about it. Or I have other things to do. A lack of urgency. There's a lack of priority. If you have other things to do, you have a lack of priority when it comes to following Yeshua. Oh, I'm going to follow you, Yeshua, but let me go do this first. Or I would, but I have other things to do. Yeshua, let me think about it. Now, I, now, now, my daughter knows. Anytime she asks me for something, I say, honey, let me pray about it. <laughs> she goes, no, Dad, because that means you're not going to do it. I said, no, no, let me pray about it. I might come back and tell you the Lord said yes. But I can't just say yes to you until I pray about it. But she thinks that means the same as, well, let me think about it. Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes when people tell you that, well, let me think about it. That means they're not, they don't want to do it. They don't want to say no to you right now. So they say, give me some time, let me think about it. And then you go back to them, the answer is still, well, I'm still thinking about it. How long does it take to think about it? Thoughts like run through our mind every day, every second, every minute, every moment, and you're still thinking about it? That means you're on the no side. Just say no. Yeshua said, if you don't want to do it, just say no. Don't be so, well, I'm trying to be nice to this person. That's not nice. To keep blowing people off and saying, I might, I'm thinking about it, I'm praying about it, but it's not happening. And you just keep, just, just tell them no. Like in this season right now, that doesn't match my purpose. Um, I, I've got other things that I need to do that I really feel the Lord's put on my heart to do. Whatever you have to tell them, be honest, right? Because when you make excuses, you're lying to that person, you're lying to yourself, and you're also lying to God. Because God knows your heart. Why not start with telling God the truth, yourself the truth, and then the Bible says, speak truth to your neighbor, amen? That's Bible, Amen. How about this other uh, excuse? Maybe you have a lack of commitment and loyalty. Wow, that's what the message is about. We should keep the commitment of our vows, right? If you have a lack of commitment and loyalty, you might say, well, I've changed my mind. Oh, well, it's too difficult. You ever start a meal plan? It got difficult because you weren't at Five Guys and in and out and you wondered like, I'm gonna do my meal plan now. It's called a lettuce wrap, <laughs> right? But oh, but I mean, but everyone else is getting a burger with the bun. I'm just going to get the burger with the bun and the fries and the, and if it, in and out. We'll do animal style burger and fries, right? That means they grill the onions and put all that nice goopy Amen. stuff on there. Yeah, but see, if you're on a meal plan and now you're going to Five Guys, you're like, well, Lord, I, I can't break, I can't keep my commitment. So because of your lack of commitment and loyalty, you say, I changed my mind. It's too difficult to do this meal plan. I'm just going to do what I used to do. I'm just going to eat like I want to eat. You know, it doesn't work for your, your gut. It doesn't work for your life. It's not going to work for your marriage. It's not going to work for your ministry. It's definitely not going to work for your faith or your family to make those kind of excuses. The last one I want to throw out there is the excuse that shows you have a lack of passion and perseverance. That's when you say things like this. I've got a lot going on. We all got a lot going on. In fact, there's a lot going on around the world right now. There's fires going on in our day, in our down the street, right? There was a lot going on for me this morning. It took me like two hours instead of one hour to just schlep all the way over here. Through the smoke and through the police saying this road's closed. But I still came regardless. I let people know I'm gonna be running late, but we're, we're, I'm not turning around. Because I have to persevere through this because I know on the other side of that spiritual attack, trying to keep me from getting here is a blessing. For not just you, but for me. What kind of rabbi would I be if I'm not a good disciple first? 
And if I'm not going to say, if, see, I already wrote this message. Am I going to use an excuse today why I couldn't come to Shua because of a lack of submission or total surrender, a lack of priority or urgency, a lack of commitment and loyalty, a lack of passion and perseverance? What kind of teacher would I be if I teach you things that I don't do? I would be like the Pharisees Yeshua rebuked. It says they're hypocrites because they teach and don't do. Do what they teach when they teach Moses. They send them to see the Moses, but don't do as they do because they teach and don't do. My second point today is that disciples should stay committed to their spiritual growth. Disciples should stay committed to their spiritual growth. You know, last week we looked at two versions of Luke 640 as we have in the past. Where Yeshua said, a disciple is not above who? His teacher. But everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. I like also the complete Jewish Bible that reads, a Talmud, which is a student or a disciple, is not above his what? His rabbi. But each one, when he is fully trained, will be like his rabbi. Okay, so if Yeshua is trying to fully train you, but you don't stay committed to your spiritual growth, how many know you won't arrive at the destination? of what Yeshua is trying to do in your life. How can he fully train you when you quit prematurely? How long did it take for Yeshua to fully train the disciples? Three years and six months. Three and a half. Just like half of the tribulation period. Just like Elijah that shut up the heavens for three and a half years because of the type of shadow. Yeshua is like Moses and Elijah. Why do you think they're on either side of him? The law and the prophets. Moses represents the law. In the school of the prophets, through Elijah, who taught Elisha, and others. Do you understand that everything is about your commitment level? Right? Your commitment to your own personal spiritual growth. How many are committed to your spiritual growth? See, this is where you can't add this excuse. Rabbi's not feeding me. Rabbi's not teaching what I want him to teach. Well, Throw it at me. You know, give, give me a chance to hear what you want to, what do you want to learn about? You know, during the pandemic, I was going through books of the Bible because I didn't know what kind of topics were most interesting. I thought, why don't we just go through books of the Bible? We started with Revelation and we started going from, from new to old to old back to new. And so we went to Daniel and we went to all these books. We started going like to John, we went to Luke, and we went to Matthew, we went to, we did Ruth. We did all these, they're online for you to watch on YouTube. But you know, when you think about that, it was all about keeping the commitment during the pandemic because we were scattered sheep. We needed a shepherd, needed a sheepfold, amen? So if you're going to be fully trained, you're going to have to amp up your commitment. And I love what Solomon said in Proverbs 16, 1, the book of Mishle. He says, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the tongue's answer is from Adonai. All of man's ways appear in his own eyes. But Adonai weighs the motives. So commit whatever you do to Adonai. That's like a vow, right? You've got to commit to it. Whatever you do to Adonai, he says, your plans will succeed. Adonai works everything out for his own purpose. Sounds like Rav Shaul. He says, all things work together for good to those who love God and call according to his purpose. He says, he works all things together after the counsel of his will. And I think what we don't realize is if we're not committed, he can't work it out. You know, in the South, they sing a song that Jesus will work it out. Right? Don't make me sing the song. But it's funny. If Yeshua is going to work it out, if Elohim, Adonai, if El Shaddai is going to work it out, he needs our commitment. Oh, Lord, I want you to work it out. Okay, I'm waiting on you. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Right? Pray to me and I will answer. Seek me and you will find me. Before you even speak, I'm already, I know what you're going to ask me anyway, but I'm just waiting for you and your commitment level to step up to the, to the plate. I'm going to swing that bat and hit that ball. You've got to step up and be a team player. Now, Hebrews, or what we like to call in the complete Jewish Bible, Messianic Jews, according to David Stern, in chapter 5, verse 12, he talks about this level of commitment to spiritual growth because he says, although you ought to be teachers by this time, in other words, you should be more spiritually grown by now. 
Again, you need someone to teach you the basics of God's saying, or what the King James says, the first principles of the oracles of God. Now, I hate to tell you, but these are the oracles of God right here. That Moses brought from Mount Sinai, according to Acts 7, 37 to 38. So when you look at this, it says the oracles of God, which is the Torah. You need somebody to go back and teach you the Torah again. Because you've lost the basics of this journey of being a disciple. Because it started coming out of Egypt to the wilderness to the promised land. And the pattern that in the promised land, Yeshua took 12, just like Moses had 12 spies. It's the same journey. It's all about what you see. You see giants that are bigger than you? Yourself as small as a grasshopper? Or do you see the grass, the giant, small like a grasshopper in the eyes of God? Which G? Big G, middle G, little G? <laughs> Which are you? All right? When you think about this, this, this passage is telling us we need to learn these oracles of God all over again. He says, you have come to need milk, meaning you're a spiritual baby, and not solid food. For anyone who is on what? Milk is inexperienced with the teaching about righteousness. How many know that's exactly what the Torah is? The teaching about righteousness and what's unrighteous, blessing and cursing, all the things that are written in the Torah. He says, you're just an infant, but solid food is for the mature who through practice have their senses trained, or King James says discern, or actually this version says trained to discern both good and evil. That's what the Torah records. Those who did good in the eyes of the Lord, those who did evil in the eyes of the Lord, what were the consequences, what were the blessings that came upon the good, the, the curses that came upon the evil, or the blessings and promises for the righteous, and those that were unrighteous, what was the outcome. That's what the Torah teaches. Amen? Now, how do we relate, relate this to spiritual growth in increments? I'll go to the disciple of Yeshua himself. 1 John 2, 12, what we call Yohanan Aleph in Hebrew. He says, I am writing to you children. Remember, children are people that drink the milk of the word, right? Mature people can handle the meat of the word, right? So we see here, he says, I'm writing to you children because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. In other words, all spiritual babes know is their sins are forgiven. And how many know that is a very important step? When you accept Yeshua as your Messiah and you know your sins are forgiven, man, the weight of sin is off your shoulders, the grief, the worry, the regret of your past, it's washed and drowned in the sea of forgetfulness, in that symbolic of that like sea of reeds, that Red Sea, it's Yam Suf for your sins, right? They're just drowned there, never to be reminded to you again, at least not by God, maybe by the adversary, who's the accuser of the brethren. He'll remind you of things you did in the past, but God will never bring it up because he promised you that the Spirit of God will only remind you of the things you've learned in the Scripture. He brings the Word back to your remembrance, but He's not going to re remind you of your sin because it's been forgiven. God's going to say, what sin? <laughs> no, that's been crucified. That's been buried. That's been washed away. Right? He says, you know, your sins are forgiven. Now watch this. Verse 13 says, I am writing to you fathers. Now how many know there's a difference between a child and a father? But there's a relationship there. He says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have known the one who is from the beginning. In other words, as mature believers, as spiritual fathers in faith, you have such a relationship with God that goes all the way back to the beginning. You understand in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You understand the beginning of the oracles of God. You understand these first beginning principles of the oracles of God. You have a relationship with God from the beginning that you started walking in this journey, and now that you're older, you not only have seen other sons and daughters be raised up, but you have this relationship that's so secure from the beginning, you've been walking with God. Not only the beginning of the scriptures, but the beginning of your faith walk. So he says, you have this relationship with you've known him from the beginning. And I love this because he goes, I'm also writing to you young men. Now here's the middle category. And I kind of jumped in verses here. He says, I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. So the child that knows their sins are forgiven, the father that has a secure relationship from the beginning, and then in the middle is the young man or young warrior that's trying to overcome the evil of the wilderness. <laughs> it's almost like the babe was snatched out of Egypt, right? Just like all those kids that went with their parents snatched out of Egypt. The young man has to fight the giants in the wilderness. And then the fathers 
they get to see their legacy come into the promised land. Do you see how God has patterns for everything? I love this because he says, watch this. In verse 14, latter part, he says, I have written to you young men again. He says, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. In other words, if you didn't connect verse 13 and verse 14, you would think you could overcome on your own. But you're not an overcomer by, by your own efforts. You're only an overcomer because you've become strong. Hazak, hazak, benin, hazak. Be strong, be strong, and you'll be strengthened in the Torah, in the Word of God, in the Scriptures. When you're strong in the Word, you know how to use the right promise for the right problem and target that in prayer. Because you know the Word. The Word is the weapon of your warfare, which is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What's coming out of your mouth? It's either a weapon of the enemy against God, or it's a weapon against the enemy from God. Your words have power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And it's like a two-edged sword that comes out of the mouth of, of, of each believer. Because Yeshua, when he comes back, he's going to have a two-edged sword come out of his mouth. It's the word of God. How are you using your sword? If you're a mighty warrior, like this text is referring to, this term young men is actually talking about young warriors. It's like equal to the term in Hebrew that you are a mighty man of valor, which is like the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. That Eshet Chayil, the virtuous woman, is the same thing we talk about the mighty man of valor. It's the same Hebrew term that refers to being mighty, being strong. It gets translated virtuous, but literally means women that know how to, you know, what's that that, that female with the little headscarf on and she's got her, so, is this something like just do it or something like this, like the slogan during wartime? You remember that? I, I forgot what her name is. Does she have? Rosie the Riveter. Ladies, you need to be like Rosie the Riveter. Right on the enemy's head. Right? Come on, like Yael. <laughs> Drive that tent peg right through the enemy's uh, thoughts. Don't let the enemy control you. You have to be an overcomer in this world. Whether you're a young man or a young woman, you need to overcome because you want to get to the place where you're mature in your faith. Do you see the three levels of growth? A babe, an infant, a young man or woman, and now a spiritual father, or maybe even a spiritual mother, like a Sarah to her daughters, like an Abraham to his sons and daughters, right? That's what you want to be. Are you with me today? Look at, if we jump back into 1 John chapter 2, same chapter, but go to verse 3, backing it up to the beginning of this, we see that this growth is connected to the Torah. Because he says, now we know that we have come to know him by this. Remember, fathers, you have known him from the beginning. Ch child, infant, you only know that your sins are forgiven. Young man, you know the word that comes from your father. And through that word, you are forgiven. But do you see what it says here? It's connected to this. Watch it. For we know that we have come to know him by this. If we keep his commandments, if you keep his Torah, the one who says, I have come to him, watch this, and does not keep his commandments, his Torah, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God is truly made perfect. We know that we are in him by this. Whoever claims to abide in him must walk just as he, Messiah, walked. I don't know if you want to be his disciple. Because when he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, you still have to walk as he walked. To follow him. To be his disciple. And the only way we're going to go from spiritual babes to young men of faith that know the word, or young women of faith that know the word, is that we've got to walk as he walked. My third and final point is this, as I close. Disciples should walk close to their rabbi and conform to Messiah's image. If you walk close with him, that's where that whole idea of the dust of the rabbi comes from. That Hebrew dictum out of the Mishnah 1-4 that says we should allow these Torah scholars to have their disciples and their disciples, disciples come into our homes and we should become dusty from the dust of their feet and drink in their words with thirst. That's what we should do. When we understand that, un that command that Yeshua probably had disciples and his disciples, disciples coming into homes like Matthew that opened up his home to all the tax collectors that were fellow tax collectors that none of the other disciples had influence over. But Matthew or Levi did. He would invite his friends to be disciples of Yeshua to follow him because he was following him. 
He was walking close to him. He's, Peter, James, and John were probably the dustiest because they were the inner circle disciples. So look at what the brother of Yeshua said. James, a.k.a. Jacob, or Yaakov in Hebrew, says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify you hearts, your hearts, you double-minded. Could it be the reason our commitment is low, we're not being conformed to the image, and we're not really walking as close to you as we, we could be walking, is that we're double-minded. What does that mean? It literally means in, in the Greek there are double souls. Our soul wants to go one direction one minute, and our soul, just like our emotions, want to go in a different direction the next minute. Because our mind is not renewed with the Word of God. You haven't become a young warrior of faith renewing your mind with the Word of God. And so when you're double-minded, one minute you want to do something, then you quit. You break your vow every time. Your commitment to your vow breaks because you're double-minded. How many of you have ever done that? I've done it. I've made a commitment, oh, I'm going to do this. And then my commitment gets watered down because I didn't realize covenant is stronger than commitment. You know, the reason you make a vow at a wedding is to honor the covenant, not your commitment. The commitment is to honor the covenant. And when you have a covenant with God, you don't easily break it because covenant means we're partners, we're in a relationship. We've made, I've, I've made a vow to keep my covenant as the focus of my commitment. And if you only have commitments, that's a watered down version of a covenant. Oh, I'm committed to you, really, until we get a divorce? Well, I'm committed to you, really, until you break my heart and date my best friend? You know, that's what relationships look like in today's world. I mean, people play, play with relationships and marriage, especially marriage. Marriage is treated like, for, we've actually redefined what marriage is, right? In our world, not we, but they, them, people that are not following Yeshua have tried to redefine marriage. But when I read about it, it's covenant, not commitment. Commitment is, is what you use to honor your covenant. And if you break your commitment, you're probably not honoring your covenant. Amen? So he says, you've got to stop being double-minded. Uh, look what Paul says uh, in Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good. That's the verse I was quoting. For those who love God are called according to his what? Purpose. It says in verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Love this. Here's the breakdown. He says he foreknew us, which means our creator knew us beforehand. Come on, Elohim, our creator knew us beforehand. You think he didn't know you were going to have obstacles and struggles and stress and trials and tribulations? He warned you about it. Yeshua said, you're going to in this world, you're going to have tribulation. But don't, don't worry. Don't get frustrated. I've overcome the world. So have some shalom. We have a good time. Just follow me. Just stay close to me. Just stay committed to me. Stay close to me. Stop pulling yourself away from me. Don't run like Adam did away from God. Draw close to God. We wouldn't be in this mess if Adam would just have drawn close to God and said, God, it was me. It wasn't that wife you gave me. It was that will that I misused when I knew better. Right? What does it mean to be predestined? If he predestined us, that means our creator planned out our destiny. That doesn't mean he predetermined your choices. When I have a destiny for my family, it's like I, I buy a home that, that will accommodate, right? Rooms for my kids to stay in, office for my wife. I don't have an office in my home. I'm in the bedroom with the desk. <laughs> I give my wife the office. She counsels ladies that live nearby and that want to seek her counsel. I do that. Plus she pays the bills. She needs a room for that. <laughs> I make the money, she tends to uh, spend the money in the right ways to, to honor the family. But we have a destiny. What that means is we're not thinking that we're going to live on the streets. We're planning a destiny that we're going to have a good home, bed to sleep in, food on the table, resources in the cupboards, right? Cars to drive, gas in the car, oil change on time. That's called destiny. You're living out your destiny when you realize you have a full life God has planned for you. 
It doesn't mean you always make the right choices, though. He can plan out your destiny and you not accept it. Because his desire and destiny is that we all be saved. But not everybody desires to walk close with Yeshua. Amen? Your own friends are going to sometimes tempt you with peer pressure. Come on, you don't have to go to shul today. Come on, we're going to party all day. Come on, we're going to get the keg and we're going to do it. Really? There's a party going on on earth, in the shul, and in heaven when one person into shul but returns back to God. I ain't missing that party. Your party's great. I'll see you guys afterwards. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Celebrate a birthday. I, I don't mind going. But I'm going to honor my commitment to be in the house of God. I'm just going to do it because as much as possible, I'm not saying you can't go on vacation, go on vacation. But just honor God in the midst of that planning. Know that God has a plan for your life. Amen? How about this one? Conforms us. He conforms us, which means our creator forms us into the image of Messiah. He conforms us. He's forming us with that image in mind. How about he calls us? Because our creator calls to um, calls us, it should say, to fulfill his purpose. He calls us to fulfill his purpose. And then he justifies us because our creator makes us righteous before him. He leads us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And then finally he glorifies us, which means our creator transforms us into, the, into a glorious masterpiece. And when you see this masterpiece, we're going to look just like Yeshua. We don't know what we'll look like, but we know we will be like him when we see him as he is. We'll be conformed to his image. And I close with Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may what? Discern what is the will of God. Remember, discern between good and evil. And he says, so you'll know what is good and acceptable and perfect. Verse 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil. Wow. Man, that makes me want to jump out of my skin and preach it all over again. Lord, how would you come at this time? How many know that this is such a blessing, not only to be blessed uh, with his benediction, but I want to remind you as he comes, disciples should keep their what? Vows. Disciples should stay committed to their what? Spiritual growth. And finally, disciples should walk close to their rabbi and conform to Messiah's image. Did you receive this message today? Yes. Amen. Would you stretch your hands towards, towards heaven? For God is a true blesser of all these blessings. As Numbers 6, 24 through 26 is said in the Hebrew tongue and also in English today. Mordechai, would you lead us in this blessing? Ya era the night for Navalecha. Be who neka. Ye saw Adonai. Yasem Lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his countenance towards you and establish peace unto you. From the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. And Shavuot Tov.